Did you know the Loch Ness Monster may have actually killed someone? On September 29, 1952, John Rhodes Cobb, a three-time world land speed record holder who'd previously driven at speeds of up to 403 miles per hour and earned the press moniker, the fastest man alive, was attempting to break the water speed record at Loch Ness. While piloting his speedboat, John Cobb attained over 240 miles per hour when his boat struck a mysterious ripple. The vessel immediately took a nosedive and disintegrated, throwing Cobb 50 feet. He instantly died. His vessel wouldn't be located for another 55 years in 2002. And then it was filmed for the first time beneath the waters of Loch Ness 72 years later in 2019. Did the Loch Ness Monster cause the crash that killed the fastest man alive? Welcome to the Astrology of Terrible Things podcast with me, Carly Heath, doing a solo show today. And this is the podcast where we bring you stories of terrible things that have happened to people. And then we delve into the astrology of the terrible thing to try and figure out why bad things happen. Important note, this podcast comes with all the trigger warnings. We talk about amusement park disasters, serial killers, catastrophic accidents, and all sorts of events that usually result in people dying. If any of that sounds like something you don't want to hear about, then please do not listen to the show. Before we get into our main story this week, I saw something interesting in the news that's weirdly relevant to episode four of this podcast. If you remember, that was the episode where we talked about baby Jessica McClure falling into the well. And we also talked about this Twitter thread I did like months ago that was all about people falling in holes in the 1980s. I'm going to bring this all <laughs> together. Don't you worry. So new research published uh, today, as I'm recording, November 24th, in the journal Science discussed a high energy cosmic ray that was detected in Utah that came from beyond our Milky Way galaxy. It opens up an entirely new branch of high energy astrophysics. This particle has an energy level that's one million times greater than what can be generated even by humanity's most powerful particle accelerators. It appears to have come to Earth in a shower of other less energetic particles. Now, this is something that happens a lot. Uh, we're constantly inundated with solar rays and cosmic rays, and usually they just kind of go through our skin. If you hold out your hand, I think they said something like, if you hold out your hand, like pretty much every minute, some sort of cosmic rays are going through your, your skin. Um, so pretty normal, but this particle is like extra spicy. Uh, first spotted by the telescope array experiment on May 27th, 2021. So if you're pulling up the astrology chart on your own, May 27th, 2021 um, in Utah. I don't know the exact location, but we don't have the time, so it doesn't really matter. It's called the Amaterasu particle. I hope I pronounced that right. And it, it its energy is uh, 224 exa electron volts which it is 244 quintillion quintillion electron vo volts and that is a number with 18 zeros this is the most energetic charged particle ever detected by this telescope array experiment. So I pulled up the chart and I'm like, I wanted to see what was going on here. And I saw the cool, coolest thing, which was, um, again, we don't have the exact time, so we don't know exactly where the moon was, uh, but the moon was, you know, somewhere between like 15 degrees Sagittarius and 29 degrees Sagittarius, which you know is in that by now, if you watch my episode four, is within the realm of the galactic center. And the galactic center is the big black hole at the center of our galaxy. And it's, uh, I've found associated with holes. I noticed when I was looking at baby Jessica McClure's chart. 
um, that galactic center point prominent in her chart, I noticed that when in the 1986-87 series of kids falling in holes that were publicized, uh, that the the galactic center figured prominently. I should have pulled up those other charts, but I think it was when Uranus was transiting. It, so it's got that that hole that black hole that uh, that galactic center vibe to it. And the moon in this case is opposite Venus. And Venus is in an exact square to Neptune. So it's really interesting whenever we look at these space charts, these charts that have to do with like the mysteries of the universe, especially like aliens and UFOs and things like that, that we always get this Neptune signature. It's really remarkable. It's almost like one, Neptune is the blurring of boundaries which is cool. Um, but Neptune is also confusion. Um, in this chart also, Mars is moving into an opposition with Pluto. Mars and Cancer is moving into an opposition with Pluto. So that's often a signature, Mars opposite Pluto of high power. And Mercury opposite uh, the moon, which is moving over the galactic center, pointing to Mercury, well dignified by the way, um, pointing to communication about this event that happened. And you know, the moon in this case is also moving into a square with Neptune. And at this point, Jupiter is in Pisces. And Jupiter's at just at the first degree of Pisces. And Pisces is just such a, a, a part of the chart that we see so much of in all of this, you know, space interest, you know, because it's really long distance travel. It's a water sign. It's the imagination. Uh, it's the end of the dark part of the year. So Pisces is just so associated with the with the mysteries, with the liminal realm. Anyway, I think it's fascinating. And we got Saturn in Aquarius. And Aquarius is that sign that's associated with outside of the wall. If Capricorn is inside the wall, everything inside the wall, whenever you we see Capricorn and Saturn and Capricorn in a chart. We're usually thinking of uh, people being trapped inside something. A wall is being built. Um, a you know we're 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 kind of building up our forces to keep out the outsiders. Whereas Aquarius is that sign that's associated with everything outside of the wall. We see a lot of space things happen um, when Saturn is transiting Aquarius as well. So I just thought that was really an interesting thing to look at uh, before we get into our discussion on the Loch Ness Monster. And why am I talking about the Loch Ness Monster today? Uh, you know, I'm just being totally honest here. <laughs> I'm still, as I talked about last week, I'm still in like the depression episode and I, for whatever reason, find myself when I'm feeling low, uh, doing r random research on, in this case, Loch Ness Monster. I feel like Loch, Loch Ness Monster is like an old friend and I'm like, let's, let's just see if we can find out more information on the Loch Ness Monster. And then I came across this John Cobb and I just was having like a lot of feelings about that incident. This man who is trying to be the fastest man alive coming into the Loch Ness Monster. Look, I think that there's this feeling I get from all of the creatures of the liminal spaces, like the Loch Ness Monster is. This feeling that they represent something very feminine. And I, I know that a lot of podcasts that, you know, talk about cryptids and talk about the mysteries of the universe and aliens tend to be hosted by men. I think people who are not men have a different sort of relationship to the mysterious creatures of the universe the creatures who cannot necessarily be recorded or studied or seen or observed. I think they speak to something of marginalization. And I I find that when women or people who are not men talk about these creatures, there is an affinity there and a respect there and a feeling like I understand this creature a little bit better 
than most cis men understand these creatures. Like I, I, you know, the question of this episode is, did the Loch Ness Monster kill John Cobb? And of course, I don't think Nessie could ever do anything wrong in her entire life. I think that if John Cobb was killed, it was obviously some sort of accident. He was in her house. (laughs) And if some dude came into my house and tried to set the water speed record, I would flap my tail and maybe break his speedboat. Not maliciously, just that's what happens. So let's get to a little backstory on Nessie before we get started. So Loch Ness contains more water than all the lakes in England and Wales combined. The Loch Ness Monster is a creature of Scottish folklore that is said to have been inhabiting the Scottish Highlands for many, many centuries. Though the 19, 1933 was like when she entered her famous era because there were sightings, started getting published in things. Uh, There were reports of this monster in the area from as early as 565 AD. And don't worry, I pull up the chart from 565 AD. I pull up the chart from 1933. We're going to see some patterns here with Nessie sightings. And I think that it gives a little clue into Nessie. And and we're going to see these patterns repeated when I pull up the chart for John Cobb and his death. So I got some of this information from an article published on theconversation.com and Smithsonian Magazine and Wikipedia, of course. And what's really interesting, this is specifically from this article published on theconversation.com. Most reports of the Loch Ness Monster don't feature long necks. Biochemist and Nessie investigator Roy Mackle said in 1976, by the way, this is Pluto and Libra, Saturn and Leo, Neptune and Sag, and Jupiter and Taurus. Pay attention to that Jupiter and Taurus. That Jupiter and Taurus is going to come up a lot. So this Roy Mackle fellow says that in 1976, there were were over 10,000 reports of the Loch Ness Monster. Um, Only about 20% of the reports mention a neck of any length. So it's, so the long, basically the point here is the long neck is not the monster's normal form. The neck, which is such, so associated with the Loch Ness Monster um, and Jupiter and Taurus, which is a signature that's going to keep coming up again and again. Something that is associated with Taurus is the neck. Jupiter and Taurus usually signifies like a long neck or a thick neck. Um, So I just think details about what Nessie's neck is like, I think is relevant here. Also less than 1%, just interesting facts of the creatures in the sighting reports are described as reptilian or scaly. Okay, now I'm gonna get into some things where I do not pronounce things correctly as if I've been pronouncing things correctly at all through this whole time, but whatever. Okay, we're going to jump back to the 6th century and we're going to talk about this ancient sighting. And this is some events described by an Irish monk named St. Columba, who is staying in the land of the Picts with his companions when he encountered local residents burying a man by the river Ness. They explained that the man was swimming in the river. So I'm assuming, I did a little research to see, okay, what is the warm time of year in Scotland? And August is like warm swimming weather. So I'm assuming this is August 565. So they explained that the man was swimming in the river when he was attacked by a water beast that mauled him and dragged him underwater. And they were not able to rescue him by boat. So he got mauled. Obviously, they got to his body at some point because uh, they were burying him. I'm, and I pulled up the chart for just like our August vibe in uh, in 565 AD. And this is the first time I noticed, hey, 
we have Jupiter in Taurus. Also, Leo is going to show up as a signature. So we got Pluto and the moon conjunct in Aquarius. Now, of course, I'm being super fast and loose with this date here. We don't know the exact date. So it that moon could very possibly not be there. But it is interesting. The chart that I randomly pulled up had Pluto and the moon conjunct. That's the astrology for you. Uh, we have Saturn in Leo, and we have a, re a combust Mercury retrograde, and we have the North Node in Leo at this point as well. And there is this really nice uh, grand trine between Uranus in Capricorn, Neptune in Taurus, Saturn getting really close to Virgo, but still in Leo. But really, really, I would say if you're going to just kind of remember one thing from this, remember that Jupiter in Taurus, because that's a signature that's going to come up a lot. Now, the best node article that first attracted attention, a whole lot of attention to the Loch Ness Monster was published on May 2nd, 1933, about a large beast or a whale-like fish. It was written by this guy, Alex Campbell, a water bailiff for Loch Ness and a part-time journalist. He discussed a sighting by Aldi McKay. Aldi and her husband, John, were driving on the A82 on, and this was uh, April 15th, 1933. So I pulled up the chart for April 15th, 1933. Uh, and this is the actual word for word description of the article. The creature disported itself, rolling and plunging for fully a minute, its body resembling that of a whale, and the water cascading and churning like a simmering cauldron. Soon, however, it disappeared in a boiling mass of foam. Both onlookers confessed that there was something uncanny about the whole thing, for they realized that here was no ordinary denizen of the depths, because apart from its enormous size, the beast in taking the final plunge sent out waves that were big enough to have been caused by a passing steamer. Feel free to play along as I'm doing this, but I pulled up the astrology chart for April 15th, 1933, the date of this sighting. And interestingly, we have Chiron in Taurus. Chiron in Taurus, very, very close to that degree that Jupiter was in Taurus when Nessie was first sighted in 565. The chart I pulled up for 565, Jupiter was at 27 degrees Taurus. And here Chiron is at 26 degrees Taurus. Now I also said to pay attention to Aquarius and Leo because those come up quite a bit. The moon is kind of transiting over that point where Uranus was in the first Nessie sighting in 565. So Uranus was at zero degrees of Capricorn. The moon was transiting between Sagittarius and Capricorn. So it was kind of within that range of that. Now that Nessie is kind of big news in the 1930s, um, people are starting to say, oh, actually I saw something way back when. And so this was published in 1934, but the sighting actually occurred in 1871. Okay, this is the account of someone named Dee McKenzie, who saw an object resembling a log, and it was described as wiggling and churning up the water, uh, moving slowly at first before disappearing. The October, again, we don't know the exact date, but October 1871, uh, we have in this case, Pluto in Taurus. So that Taurus point keeps on getting hit. Okay, which brings us to John Cobb, who in the 1950s, the early 1950s, would die on Loch Ness. There is some evidence that a very strange wave occurred in the otherwise very still Loch Ness. And that wave kind of points to that maybe a creature underneath the surface of the Loch had caused that wave, which caused John Cobb's boat to be destroyed. We'll take a look at it. We will discuss all of the parallels. Uh, but 
looking at these charts and kind of like looking at this history, it is really, really interesting. So John Cobb was the three times holder of the world land speed record in 1938, 1939, and 1947. And he was born in Escher, Surrey on December 2nd, 1899, near Brooklyn's motor racing track where he frequented as a boy. So if you're going to see speed and racing show up in this guy's chart, uh, yes, you are going to see it show up in his chart in a big way. He was the son of a wealthy fur broker. We're going to see so much Jupiter in his chart. Uh, and he went to Eaton, so he's like super rich. He went on to pursue motoring as a hobby uh, while he did basically the family business John Cobb broke the world land speed record at Bonneville Salt Flats on September 15th, 1938, and he achieved 350 miles per hour. I cannot even imagine going that fast. He broke it a second time uh, on August 23rd, 1939, achieving 360 miles per hour. And again, in 1947, on September 16th, he beat his own record by reaching 394 miles per hour. And he even clocked runs at 403 miles per hour. I do not know why those weren't included or recorded, but there we are. And that was when he earned the moniker, the fastest man alive. And it remained in place as he was the fastest man alive until 1963. So after the 1947 achievement, um, he was like, he decided he's going to become the water speed guy. And so he, again, super rich. He commissioned a jet powered speed boat called the Crusader and decided to use Loch Ness for the speed trial. The queen mother even met with him two days before his death. Uh, she wished him good luck um, because he was setting the record for Britain. And is, when, you, when you watch the BBC video of this, like everything's like, oh, he died for Britain. Blah, blah, blah. And uh, I just cannot imagine the, the patriarchy, the amount of propaganda that boys in the 1950s grew up with that's a whole nother thing but this guy had a you'll see his chart he has a very huge stellium in Sagittarius which we will dissect and get into so he was at Loch Ness for six weeks uh attempting to achieve this record. So I guess he, every day he would wait till the weather was calm and clear and he would go out with his speedboat and run it as fast as it, he could. And there would be official timekeepers there. I'm sure those guys were hired and paid. This was a lot of money. I think I read that his speedboat cost like 15,000 pounds, which in the 1950s, I'm sure was a lot. Uh, someone do the math on that and let me know. So he got up to 185 miles per hour on sun, some days, but he wanted to go faster, of course. And on the day he died, he reached 240 miles per hour. The vessel then, as it reached that speed, there you can kind of see in the video, and there are other people who like got higher res video and like looked at it, but you can kind of see like a random little ripple that like happens. That's kind of like. What caused that? There, there's nothing else on the water. There's nothing that seems to cause it. Um, but then his his boat sort of like suddenly just takes a nosedive and just like it almost explodes. It just kind of tears apart. And you see this. It's, it's really sad. You see this figure like being launched out of the vehicle and hit the water. And the thing is, his wife was there like the whole time. Um, watching all of this, so she probably saw it. It's just bad, tragic news. But he, the good news is he's died instantly and probably didn't even really know what happened. But it would be another 55 years before they actually located the vessel at the bottom of the lock. 
And that was in 2002. And then they actually filmed it for the first time in 2019. So 72 years after this disaster was when they finally like actually physically saw it. Okay, so let's look at John Cobb's chart. He was born December 2nd, 19th. Eight, December 2nd, 1899. We don't know his time of birth, so we're, we're kind of looking at a, an untimed chart here. But he has the biggest Sagittarius stellium I have ever seen. He's got everything except for Jupiter in Sagittarius. And you're like, wait a minute, what? He has everything except for Jupiter and Sagittarius. Yeah, so where's Jupiter? Jupiter is in Scorpio. So Jupiter is providing for all of those Sagittarius planets from a Mars ruled sign. And yeah, Mars is in Sagittarius too. And guess what? His Mars is at 21 degrees Sagittarius. And on the day he dies, transiting Mars is at 21 degrees Sagittarius. Yes, he had his Mars return on the day he died. That's pretty amazing. Okay, so we got the stellium of planets in Sagittarius, and these are opposite Pluto and Neptune in Gemini. Neptune is almost exactly opposite his Saturn. Saturn is at 24 degrees Sagittarius and Neptune's at 26 Sagittarius. Death by water, I mean, <laughs> it's, yeah, anyway. Pluto is at 15 degrees of Gemini and his Chiron is at 15 degrees Sagittarius. So there's like like this opposite Pluto Chiron opposition. And then his North Node is in, oh no, actually the, yeah, the North Node is in Sagittarius at 20 degrees. And so that, you know, the, that Neptune and Pluto on, are on either side of his South Node in Gemini. Um, yeah, so he's, we don't know where exactly his moon is, but his moon looks like it's most likely in Sagittarius. Uranus is at eight degrees Sagittarius. Moon is at 10 degrees Sagittarius. Chiron's at 15 degrees Sagittarius. Mercury retrograde is at 18 degrees Sagittarius. Uh, Mars, it's at 21 degrees Sagittarius. Saturn is at 24 degrees Sagittarius. And uh, Venus is at 29 degrees Sagittarius. And we've just been having this trend of people dying tragically when their Venus is at a 29th degree of a sign. I think that's really fascinating. But it is important to note, you know, we have a Mercury in Sagittarius, which we've talked about in our last episode. Oh, we have Mercury in Sagittarius right now as I'm recording this. So it's interesting that I'm drawn to an event that has a Mercury in Sagittarius signature. Uh, and we know that Mercury does not do well in Sagittarius. Mercury is like, I have the big idea, um, but the poor execution, the huge charm, uh, but not so much competency. That said, he's been extremely lucky, this guy. Uh, and with all of that Jupiter signature, yeah, he better be lucky. But it's really also just very interesting of what the, the Sagittarian signature is with Jupiter in Scorpio being like, this guy is obsessed with going fast. <laughs> Mars and Jupiter together being speed. Uh, the 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 quest i'm gonna achieve this this goal i'm gonna go far and you know he is going far because he's going all the way to utah he's going to scotland he's going he is traveling long distances um he's trying to figure out how to get places fast <laughs> um so, uh, so that's that sagittarian signature is really strong especially with the mars in sagittarius and jupiter in Scorpio, that mutual reception. And basically we got a lot of fire and we got a lot, we got a little bit of water and a little bit of air in his chart, but no earth. And which is really interesting for someone who's setting the land speed record, land speed record, but there is no earth in here at all. 
The chart of his death is September 29th, 1952. Did I get the exact time? I did get the exact time. I have here 2.55 p.m. Um, at Inverness, Scotland. So this is where we see in his death chart, uh, September 29th, 1952, we see Jupiter in Taurus, which is where Jupiter was in 565 AD during the first recorded Nessie sighting, where Jupiter was at 27 degrees Taurus. And here Jupiter is at, yes, Jupiter is at 20 degrees of Taurus. We also have the moon in Aquarius and we have Pluto in Leo. That, that Aquarius Leo axis is very strong. Very importantly, we have Mars in Sagittarius at 21 degrees, his exact Mars return. So I would guess that this fellow had a day chart if he died during his Mars return. I would almost guess that his fifth house, because he was on a fifth house year, um, I almost want to guess like maybe his fifth house was Mars ruled. Maybe his fifth house was Scorpio. I'm just making guesses here, but it would make sense then that his whole life is in pursuit of this, this goal, this quest. And if if Sagittarius is his sixth house and Scorpio is his fifth house, the idea of him being almost a servant. And that's, that's the thing that we came up in the BBC video. He was doing it for Britain, you know, doing it in service of Britain. So this idea that he's like a servant for this, this greater idea of, of glorifying Britain through this desire to set this land speed record. So that's my guess. If I were to rectify his chart, I would say his fifth house is Scorpio, his sixth house is Sagittarius. That would make his ascendant Cancer. We will never know, but uh, I think it's it's really interesting. So uh, my thesis statement, my thesis question is, was John Cobb killed by Nessie? I think it's really, really interesting that Jupiter is in Taurus, which is the same place that it was in when the first Nessie sighting happened. Um, I think it's really interesting that that in the 1933, the like the more legit sighting, which is the April 15th, 1933 sighting, we have Jupiter in Virgo, Mars in Virgo, Neptune in Virgo, making squares to his placements in Sagittarius. I think it's interesting that the south node in his death chart is right about where the Saturn was in the April 15th, 1933 sighting chart. Pluto at 22 degrees Leo. In the 565 chart, we got the sun at 8 degrees of Leo. We got Saturn at 25 degrees of Leo. And in the chart of John Cobb's death, we have Pluto at 22 degrees of Leo. And we have the south node at 19 degrees of Leo. There are these interesting patterns. And we're going to carry this through. There was the 1871 sighting where Pluto was in Taurus near where Jupiter was. Then the 10,000 sightings in 1976, Jupiter was in Taurus. Then Ness the Nessie search that's, hap that's happened in 2023, uh, which is now Jupiter's in Taurus. And then John Cobb's death in 1952, Jupiter's in Taurus. It's just really interesting that that Jupiter and Taurus signature keeps on showing up and it makes you just kind of like reflect, okay, what is Taurus? Taurus is an earth sign um, ruled by Venus and Jupiter 
is a planet that rules both Sagittarius and Pisces. So Pisces is the water home of Jupiter. Sagittarius is like the, the fire sign that is the quest for adventure, the quest for knowledge. Pisces is like the mysteri mysteries of the deep and the liminal realm. And so Jupiter, the sign, the planet that rules those two signs, being in the Earth sign of Taurus, it speaks to the big water creature going on to land. Um, I, I just think that's it's really interesting. Let's just see how the astrology plays out with the finding of the Crusader and also some other characters that show up kind of related to John Cobb's death. So July 5th, 2002, at 3 p.m., the remains of the Crusader were found. And in this chart, Saturn is opposite Cobb's natal Mars. So remember that natal Mars, that the transing Mars conjunct his natal Mars was his death. And that Saturn, you know, which only hits that opposition point every 30 years, happened to be opposite that natal Mars when the remains of the Crusader were found. That's pretty amazing. The moon was in Taurus, right? Uh, Pluto is conjunct the south node in Sagittarius. Pluto was conjunct Cobb's natal Chiron at 15 degrees Sagittarius. And Saturn was conjunct Cobb's natal south node. It's so fascinating how even after your death, key things related to you will show up when planets hit certain trigger points on your birth chart. Okay, then we'll look ahead to when the Crusader was first actually sighted and recorded on footage under the water. I'm using a timestamp that was on the video footage and that timestamp was March 28th, 2019 at 1228. And we have Jupiter conjunct Cobb's natal Saturn in Sagittarius. The sun conjunct uh, the midheaven of the transit chart. It was a Leo rising chart. Transiting Pluto was conjunct um, the south node. It's interesting how the south node keeps on coming up in Pluto conjunction. So all that's really, really interesting. Your, your chart just keeps on working for you long, long after your death, especially that Jupiter, you know, the planet of luck, conjunct Cobb's natal Saturn, you know, the Saturn, the planet of endings, the planet of death, but also Saturn, the planet that is about things sticking around for a really long time. And in this case, the eternal nature of that watercraft being under the water and likely staying there for a long time. And then there was even the, a plaque put at Loch Ness commemorating the site of his death. It's also interesting to look at who, other characters who come into play and who are interested in this topic. So Tim Dinsdale is a British cryptozoologist who wrote extensively on Loch, the Loch Ness Monster. And he himself had a sighting in 1970. His birthday is uh, September 27th. He was a former RAF engineer and he slowed down the film footage of John Cobb's death. And he is really convinced that the killer ripple was move, moving way faster than any boat could have caused a ripple to move. He thinks that ripple was definitely from a creature underneath the water. Uh, he filmed what remains one of the few alleged sightings of the Loch Ness Monster with a humped creature appearing to leave a massive wake. He has Jupiter at 13 degrees Sagittarius, nestled right between John Cobb's natal Chiron and his son. His natal Chiron is conjunct John Cobb's south node. Tim Dinsdale's son is conjunct the sun of John Cobb's death. And his Venus and North Node are conjunct Pluto and the South Node of John Cobb's death. It's amazing how his chart 
hits all of these points related to John Cobb and John Cobb's death. Well, the scribes start, we don't have the exact birth time, but it's a sun in Libra and like I said, a Venus in Leo, Mercury in Virgo, moon either conjunct Mercury or opposite but definitely opposite Uranus. The moon, we're not exactly sure on the timing. So the moon is definitely co-present with Mercury. Um, how close or far away from it, it's, you know, it's within about 10 degrees. And Mars in Aquarius and Chiron in Aries and Pluto in Cancer. So that Pluto in Cancer and that Saturn in Scorpio, very and Uranus in Pisces, very interested in water, this fellow is. Um, and But, you know, he's got a very strong Mercury. And he's got a very strong interest in the strangeness. Kind of square. Well, Jupiter's moving into a square with his, his Mercury. But I kind of, I tend, I, I'm going to go ahead and say I trust this guy, Tim Dinsdale. You know, he's got a good Mercury. He's got a good head for technology. He's got a good head for information. His moon is in Virgo. His sun is in Libra. He has a sense of justice. He's got a well-dignified Jupiter. He's got a sense for truth. I'm going to say I trust this guy. His, like, destiny is to bring the truth of John Cobb's death to light. So looking at all of this, I think I... I believe Tim Dinsdale, and I think that John Cobb is intricately connected to the Loch Ness Monster. Does the Loch Ness Monster exist? Well, I mean, you're asking the wrong person for like an objective answer because I'm going to say that, you know, I tend, I believe in the Loch Ness Monster. So I'm going to confirmation bias my way into saying that, yes, the Loch Ness Monster is real. But that said, on a more philosophical level, I think all the things that are from the imagination and from the liminal realm are real. <laughs> and I know that sounds weird to say, but I think that the things in our head can be just as real and impactful as the things that other people can see and touch, and sometimes more so. Sometimes the things in your head are more real uh, than the things that actually exist because there could be creatures on the bottom of the ocean floor that will never ever be seen by humans. And in a way, just because those might exist and are real, they aren't as impactful on humanity as the thoughts that are in the collective's imagination. And so what are my conclusions as I come to this kind of like looking at these patterns of events, people, and things related to the Loch Ness Monster? I think I do want to do a second episode on this because there's so many more things that I haven't even begun to touch on. Uh, but I think I see something extremely comforting in the fact that a creature that may or may not exist shows up astrologically in a pattern that is connected to real humans and in that way, regardless of whether she exists or not, she is important and real. So if you're at all interested in having your own terrible story talked about on the Astrology of Terrible Things, uh, we are asking listeners to send in their stories. So if you have a terrible thing that happened to you uh, and you can find out the time that it happened, it doesn't have to be exact, but if you could tell us daytime or nighttime, before noon or afternoon, before midnight, after midnight, that's really helpful. Send us the location that it happened and like a brief paragraph about what happened to you. And send it, email it to the astrology of terrible things at gmail.com. And if you want to include your birth day, time, and location, that's helpful too, but totally not necessary. Thanks for joining us today. Music for the show is provided by Bruno Loredo. Follow us on Instagram at the Astrology of Terrible Things, all one word. Music.